everybody. Welcome back to Speakers at Pratt Manhattan. Um, we've been covering, this semester we've been covering games, gaming, and all that goes along with that, like creating the games, publishing the games. Um, last, last time we spoke about digital games, and this week we're going to talk about um, analog and digital games with a Pratt alumnus, Noel Posadas. Hi, so I'm Noelle. I graduated from Pratt back in 2010 with a BA in communications design and slash illustration. Um, I now work at an educational game design company called Killer Snails. Um, we make mostly science games. Um, and I want to tell you the story of this game that we've been working on this past year called Biome Builder. Biome Builder is an analog card game. It's a ton of fun quick to play. We designed it with kids in mind. And the night the inspiration struck was actually at the Playcrafting Bit Awards. They're an award show every, that goes on every year for local game development. Um, last year, our company was nominated for Best Tabletop Game for our game Assassins of the Sea, which is about killer venomous sea snails. You might have heard a little bit about that while I was being brought on. <laughs> um, basically, we won the award last year. And after a big high of winning the award and going to the after party, I got on a train home at 1 in the morning. And I uh, was got to thinking. Um, some of you might know about a lot of famous things that were thought of on trains. Mickey Mouse, Harry Potter, all thought of on a train. My thought on the train was Biome Builder. <laughs> I, in the middle of the night on the train, wrote on my phone, because I didn't have any pen or paper, all the rules and the balance of the cards just in my phone, and went back home, got home at like 2 in the morning, could not sleep. I was thinking all night of this game that I thought of, and these like eight rules I had written down. And the next day, I was like, I have to see if it works. So I read my rules over, and they made sense. And it was amazing. I was like, OK, I can try and make this work. So that was how Biome Builder was thought through. Um, let's see. So some of you probably know the basics of game design. You need mechanics, you need goals, you need rules, components, and setting. Um, this was my first card game that I designed from start to finish. Prior to that, I had worked at several companies making digital and analog games, developing them with a team. But this was the first one where I conceived of the idea. So in this game, there's a stacking mechanic. In the game, you're basically making food chains from four different environments, ecosystems, and then there is these effect cards that'll affect the environments and the people playing. Um, and those were the basic mechanics. The goal of the game is to collect the most points and have the most stable biomes, stable food chains. Um, there's rules that you have to like, the order which you can stack and things. Their components are the cards, the setting would be the amount of people playing and all of that. Can anyone name a game where they can think of some of these components in game design? Anyone in the room? Can it be an old game? Yep, it could be any game. Solitaire? Yeah, Solitaire is a great game. So what are some of the mechanics of Solitaire? Mechanics are basically what you, what you have to do in the game. So stacking, cards. stacking cards would be in Solitaire. What's your goal in Solitaire? To win. <laughs> it is to win, but um, in Solitaire, you're, you're trying to diminish the whole pile of cards in front of you, right? You're trying to stack so that all the cards, or mo at least as many cards as you can, have disappeared from that stack. Um, are there any rules in solitaire that you have to follow? That's a good rule in solitaire. Um, the components of solitaire, that's easy. It's a deck of cards. Um, and the setting, it's played by yourself. So the setting is really like a table in front of you. <laughs> um, and that's just a simple way to think of game design. Is like you want to think of these components. 
and the game breaks down into these, these sections for most games. You can do it for almost any game. So what makes a good educational game is that you have those mechanics or components line up to the education that you're trying to teach. Um, so, sorry, hold on one second. Um, the mechanics are a great way to reinforce the education because you can use the mechanic to demonstrate what you're trying to teach. And as an educational game company, we tr strive to have the mechanics push the learning forward. Um, with Biome Builder, you have the stacking of the cards, which leads you to understand how food chains work because food chains always begin with a plant, so you have to start with a plant in your stack. Then an herbivore or an omnivore eats that plant, and then predators and apex predators eat those underling animals, right? So we also had, at some point, created these effect cards a little bit later down the line. And the effect cards, we wanted to show that outside things can infect the environment and ecosystem. And for example, with the climate change card or migration, when someone plays that card, they are forced to migrate their hand, everyone is forced to migrate their hand to the person on the left. So everyone's cards that are in their hand have to pass to the person on the left. And this is a dramatic effect. I mean, we've had fights break out <laughs> because people were playing and got so offended that they lost the cards in their hand. Um, but it's demonstrating how awful and how great a problem climate change is. Animals are being forced to migrate out of their ecosystems and affecting ecosystems throughout the world. So that was why we wanted to have the card have such a dramatic effect and we wanted to actually have people migrate their hands and physically move the things they had in their hands to someone else. Just demonstrating what is actually happening when migration happens. So testing is really important. We tested with probably hundreds of kids and families and game designers and players prior to even going on our Kickstarter. And then after Kickstarter, we tested with that much more <laughs> testers. Um, you need to test throughout the project. So the first test I did was when I had that idea and wrote down all those rules, I sat down and was like, I need a couple of decks of cards. So I went to the store, I bought a bunch of cards, broke them up into the cards I needed to demonstrate the game, and played against myself. I made four players, and I played each of the four players. And that test told me, OK, it doesn't break. You can play through, and it goes from start to end, and you can get scores that everyone has a round number of scores. You want scores that aren't like too different, usually especially when you're doing those initial tests, when you're playing against yourself. And you want to basically see if it works. After that, I uh, brought all my coworkers into the fold. So I brought the game to one of our game jam me weekly meetings. And I was like, OK, I thought of this game a few weeks ago. I wanted to see if you guys enjoyed it. And we played it. And I already knew it didn't break, but now with four players, I could see if it was any fun. Like, that's a big part of making a game. Like, I can't judge if it's fun. I thought of the idea. <laughs> I, uh, I'm playing against myself. There's no competitiveness. There's no reason that I will be able to determine if it's fun. But my coworkers were like, this is enjoyable. This is a fun game. Um, we played a bunch of times among ourselves. And in that play testing, we figured out that we needed the effect cards. And these effect cards greatly changed the game, but they also made it more competitive. They made it more fun. And those were all great ideas that were given to the game. When you're testing, a good thing to do is listen to what people are saying. People are going to know when something's wrong. They're going to tell you when something is boring. You need to take those to heart. It's hard to hear that your, <laughs> your game isn't perfect, but testing and iteration on the Game design is important for making a successful game. Even kids, when they're testing, they will tell you very bluntly what is wrong with the game. And they will give you suggestions. They might not all be good suggestions, but if they're seeing something that's wrong, it's there's something wrong. You need to 
a kid knows when something isn't working. Um, yeah. So listen to feedback. Don't take it personally. It's not a direct attack against you. Like, I think one of the most valuable lessons I learned at Pratt was being able to listen to critique. And that goes with you throughout your career. So listen to that feedback and incorporate change. And test with a variety of people, but also test with your target audience. Um, so many people develop kids games, and they only test it with adults. <laughs> and you go, well, does a kid know this? Or will a kid understand this rule, or things like that? Um, also, don't be afraid to reference things. We, Biome Builder references games like Uno and Solitaire and plenty of other games that you, you've probably all seen. But those games are thoroughly tested. So you pulling ideas from them is not, it's not stealing. That's how you create better games. So. We also had to think about funding for our project. We got the majority of the project done prior to seeking outside funding. Um, and honestly, Kickstarter and most other crowdsourcing places will tell you the same. And even investment firms. They, they don't want you to come there with just like an idea. You need to have stuff thought through and worked through. Um, you can get funding in a variety of ways. We work in an educational company. We also get government grants for some of our games. Um, there's programs where you can like seek out government grants for your small business and you should look into those if you're looking to make something that could fit into some government program you'd be surprised what actually fits in um, but we went with Kickstarter for our game and with Kickstarter it's a lot about getting out there and getting people to see your game um, and also reaching out to everyone you know Kickstarter is right here in Brooklyn so if you have an idea and you've worked on it and you want to see if it's a viable thing on Kickstarter, you can contact them. They're very easy to contact and they love to see new projects. We went to the Kickstarter offices and showed off our game. They gave us incredible feedback. So some of that feedback was on the card design itself. Um, they suggested and we heard them out that we have illustrated cards. We didn't have the time or resources to actually illustrate the cards in time to have the game available when we wanted, but we heard them out and thought, you know what, we can add illustrations to these cards in more simple ways. We added these background illustrations. Another great suggestion that they had, which was just a usability thing that we hadn't thought of, having numbers on both sides of the cards because you don't know if a player is left-handed or right-handed or how they hold the cards. So it's helpful to have the number on both sides. Um, they also gave us some great suggestions for our video for the game. Um, our Kickstarter video had started with me creating a bunch of animations of animals speaking with children's voices. And they were like, wait, you have children and you're not just putting them in costumes and recording them while in costume? So, we ended up doing this thing. Hi, I'm Lion here, and I'm here to tell you about an awesome new card game called Biome Builder. In this game, you're stacking species from different biomes to create the ideal food chain. What's a biome? Great question, bottom feeder. A biome is a community of plants and animals unique to a habitat. Everyone in the habitat has a job that makes their environment a great home for everyone in the community. Back to the game. In the game, there are four different environments. The Amazon Rainforest, the Pacific Ocean, the Sahara Desert, and the American Prairie with 48 unique plants and animals. Your goal is to stack species from plants to herbivores or omnivores to predators and apex predators cards creating a food chain. An ideal food chain stacks cards from one plant to two to three to four to five apex predators. To win, you must have the most points in your bank biome cards. Biome Builder is a fast-paced two to four player game that takes 15 minutes to play. 
Watch out, there are effect cards lurking into the deck too. Wait, where are effect cards? Effect cards reflect real world environmental issues. For example, climate change is causing species to migrate to new places and severely affecting biomes everywhere. When you play a migration card, all players must pass the cards in their hand to the player on the left. Did you tell them about killer snails? No! Some of you may remember the folks from Killer Snails and their first game on Kickstarter, Assassins of the Sea. I do, I do. That's the game that went on to be 250% funded on Kickstarter and then went to win 2016 award for best tabletop game. Assassin's MC has been featured in several gaming conferences and, and fan made us a theme song on YouTube. Killer snails, assassins of the sea. So we did it and we at Killer Snails would like to thank the Kickstarter community for all of its success. We would love all you on Kickstarter to build some biomes and learn more about the amazing creatures we share a planet with. So basically a lot of the suggestions that they gave us were to have more gameplay footage of people playing the game. And the best suggestion they gave us was put the kids in costumes in the video. So we tried to incorporate the kids around the explanation of the game. We also had some of our animation still. It was uh, a fun sort of video that we were trying to introduce people to the game, but also um, be very uh, s sure to explain the game. Because a lot of Kickstarter videos, you'll see it's more of an idea. We had a product already. We were ready to sell. <laughs> um, the kids had a ton of fun, I think, doing some of the footage for us, too. <laughs> Um, we were targeting teachers and parents for the game because it is an educational card game and we wanted to get it out before the holidays so when you're trying to get something out before the holidays you have to get it out you have to think of it way further ahead than you think you can't have something you're th you're trying to get out in September we had our Kickstarter campaign start I think in July and uh, it finished in August and we already had basically everything ready for our printer to just take and print. We had like a final look through and we sent it off to be printed. Um, and prior to even going to Kickstarter, you need to talk to a printer, you need to find out how much your cost is per unit and have that all ready so that when you make your Kickstarter, you have realistic numbers in there. Um, another, if you're doing a digital game, Digital games are a little bit amorphous because they don't have physical products. You're not thinking of a per unit price. You have to think about how much work you put into the game, how many people you had to hire to make the game, how much is your break even for the game, and then figure out, based off of that, how much you want to charge. And it's all going to be dependent also on marketing and other things because maybe you want to sell it for a dollar in iTunes and you can sell a million copies of it. But maybe you want to sell it on Steam and you're only selling like 10,000 copies and you're selling it for $10. So you have to think of things like that. So games don't just get um, awards. You don't just like sit around and hope people really liked your thing and want to talk to you about it and give you money and give you awards. You have to reach out. Um, I really never realized this before, like even Oscar people, they have like committees of people for films that go around and try to get people to want those films to be featured in festivals and win awards prior to winning an Oscar. So like you have to reach out to a lot of people. Um, we reached out to tons of people at different events. During our Kickstarter campaign, we reached out to the New York Botanical Gardens, the New York Hall of Science. Um, we had events at all these things. We went to the Brooklyn Strategist, which is, they have summer camps, and we played with, I think, 40 kids there played the game. And you have to reach out during your campaign. You have to seek people out via email. You have to uh, basically email your entire email list. People won't hate you. <laughs> I was, that was my biggest fear, emailing everyone on my email list. I was like, but what if so-and-so never wants to talk to me again? 
And then you realize like if so-and-so never wanted to talk to you again, you probably never wanted to talk to them either. So <laughs> don't be afraid, email everyone you know. Um, a great thing is get your friends to email everyone they know. Sure. <laughs> and uh, reach out on social media, Twitter, Facebook, all of that is important. Like, I can't believe how many of my friends were kind enough to share my uh, Kickstarter post with everyone in their friend group. And you'd be amazed, you get like little comments that go, oh, my friend's a teacher, what, what age range is this for, what grade level, and you, you're so impressed by how thoughtful people are about your project. I got so many emails from past uh, students that I went to school with who were just like, oh my god, you're doing something so cool, I'm doing this, and I would s support and share their projects as well. Um, but you need to reach out to your communities. If you have a game that, we have a game that's very specific that teaches science education. So we reached out to every science educational thing that you could think of in New York. So we asked people at those events to play the game, and we sent them home with pamphlets on how to you know, get the game on Kickstarter. Uh, we tested with hundreds of more kids in this time period, too. So then you get to production. We uh, luckily already had a printer on mind. We already had pricing. You got to have that all before you go on Kickstarter. And then we were reaching out for awards. Um, the first award that we received was the Boston Festival of Indie Games Best Family Tabletop Game, and that was back in October. I'm very exhausted in this picture. I had been working all day playing the game with probably hundreds of more families and kids from like 8 in the morning till 6 in the evening, and then the award ceremony was directly after, so like no rest, <laughs> and then an after party, so like that, it, it was fun. <laughs> but um, we reached out to them, we submitted our game. Boston Festival of Indie Games is actually a really nice venue. They actually have you come show off the game. You can sell it there. They, uh, when you're nominated, you receive a table at the event and you can show off the game there. Um, we are right now nominated for a bid award for best tabletop game. The bid awards, as you might remember, is the award ceremony where I thought of the game. So we already have like thoughts and plans for what we're gonna say if we win, I hope. <laughs> I hope I get to tell an abbreviated version of the story of how we thought of the game um, at the award event. But it's next Friday, so if you have any inkling that you want to go to the Playcrafting Bid Awards, they're selling tickets. I know they're online right now. And yeah, the, that's how we made a game in a year. <laughs> it's a tough process, but you can do it. You can think of an idea and bring it to fruition if you just work at it. I was lucky enough to have a huge team that was helping me, a huge team, a whole four other people. <laughs> and uh, they were all lovely, and thanks to them, we got 350% funded on Kickstarter. I can't claim even a quarter of that by myself. <laughs> so I, I have to say I, I'm very grateful that I work at a company that lets me think of these sorts of things on a, you know, weekly basis <laughs> and creating uh, wonderful products that help so many students. I want to thank you all for letting me talk. And uh, if you need to reach me, that's my email address and my Twitter handle. So, uh, can we open up for questions? Sure. It really depends on the company, it depends on the team. I mean, this game took a year, and that's pretty fast for an analog game to get from like idea to not just printing. It's on the shelves. You can buy it right now on our website at killersnails.com. Um, it's right here. <laughs> and, uh, but I've worked at different companies. I worked at a digital mobile game company, and we were working on like four games at once. And 
they would have any sort of, they would go all the way from like three month cycles to a year and a half cycle for some of them. And that was just for mobile games. So it, it can vary depending on the medium, on what you're making, the size of the team, the size of the project. So digital games are faster than analog games? I wouldn't say that's necessarily the case. Um, there's AAA games that take four or five years to make. Um, so like if you're looking at like Call of Duty or something like that, that took years to make and hundreds of people. Um, in my experience, I've worked at smaller uh, indie developers. So this analog game took a year. How long would you say Assassins of the Sea took? Um, about a year also. About a year also. I would say like you could potentially get something done analog very quickly because usually analog games are made by smaller teams. And, but there's like games like Magic that have no end. They're still in development now, so. And a solid like two and a half to three months of that is production if you are um, mass producing a game because mm -hmm. there's like a lot of back and forth. Right? Yeah, you have to talk to your printer back and forth a lot. So it, it's different things. Like sometimes the development of a game takes a long time. Sometimes testing it with people, like you might not have a lot of testers. You might have lots of changes that are going on in the game. Lots of different factors go into how long a game can take to make. Um, I would say a year isn't necessarily typical, but it's pretty good for a, to have a game go from idea to product that quickly. We, um, sure, she was asking about um, reaching out to printers and where we're distributing. Um, for Biome Builder, right now we're only distributing on the website, but we're trying to get it on Amazon. Usually Amazon is pretty quick to add um, Kickstarter projects that have been successful onto Amazon. Um, ours, I think, has been taking a while just because of the holidays, so Amazon's a little you know, taken over by the holidays. Um, but our other game is on there, so Assassin's of the Sea is still available on Amazon. Um, for printers, um, your printer is gonna, you're gonna basically get different price ranges depending on how many you're going to print. So say you're like, I only want 500 printed, he might go, well, that's gonna be 1050 a box, so that's 1050 a unit. So that's 1050 that you, paid for the game and you have to get back to even sell it to have you know minimal viability so then you're charging probably like 20 or 30 dollars for the game so like if you're charging 30 or actually some of them are 30 or 40 so no one's going to pay 30 dollars for this little box here <laughs> so um, he's going to give you price ranges. He's going to say for 500 copies, it's going to be this price. For 1,000 copies, it's going to be this price. For 2,000 copies, it's going to be this price. And you're going to have to gauge that on how much you think you can sell. So Kickstarter is a great way to find out how much you can initially just sell immediately. So people are most likely buying one on Kickstarter when they're backing you. So you could be like, well, I know we based it off of a previous Kickstarter about how much we thought we would need to print and to get it. Um, you can go based off of how other people have done it. Um, but we, I think we got like, what was it, 1,500 or 1,000, 15? Yeah, we got 1,500 copies. And then there was the, the price per unit, which was lower, thankfully, because of that, that amount that we were ordering. And then we were able to price it on Kickstarter for that amount. So you have to do a lot of back and forth and research, but you really have to think, how much do I think I can sell my game for? If you're selling like some huge Stratego, lots of little pieces game, <laughs> like you might be able to sell that for 50 bucks. So then you could be like, well, maybe I only need 500 if he's gonna charge me $10 a unit. Welcome. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. And when you were developing the, um, the game, the analog game you have now, Bio Builder, and you needed illustration, did you handle the illustration or did you hire an illustrator? I handled the illustration. Um, 
it's hard when you're the sole illustrator. Like, the reason not every animal is illustrated in our game is because as an illustrator, if it was just me doing all those illustrations, it would have taken me probably two months, like reasonably two months to get just those creatures illustrated. Um, I handled the background illustrations, which was my compromise between the two. Um, and basically I just, I figured out uh, what would work best in the time frame that we had. So that's a, it's a cost and effect thing. So you have to think like, everything could be beautifully illustrated. And even as an illustrator who really wants to draw all those pictures, I have to go, it's gonna take me two months to draw all those pictures. So I already have all these animals photographed and I had the legal rights to use all those animals. So you have to make sure that your pictures are uh, Creative Commons. Always search in Creative Commons if you're gonna take pictures straight from the internet to use in your products or in anything, really. Um, but. I had all these images already set, and I would have loved to have illustrated all the cards, and maybe in the future we will in a different edition, but for the, to get it out before Christmas and the holidays, we really, we push to have that minimal amount of illustration in there. And we're also an educational game, so sometimes having realistic animals, like having the actual photos of them is helpful for kids, because they're not like, they're not a step away from the actual creature. Like an illustration, you're stepping, oh, you're one step further from showing the actual thing. So even if you're a great illustrator, it's still not the real thing. The other, the other question I had is, let's say, like, where the inspiration, um, like, I feel really inspired by seeing this, this presentation in all the different components and having sort of a step-by-step, -step, these are the things you need to think about in creating the game. Um, let's say you don't work in a gaming company and you have some ideas for a game, mm -hmm. but and you want to, you need you need the support and the backing. Obviously, like it, it looks like you just it would be very difficult to push a game out there completely on your own. How would you suggest pitching your ideas to a company like yours or some of the other companies that you know about? Play crafting. <laughs> My coworker just helped me out there. Playcrafting is a really great resource. Um, you could actually do this by yourself. I mean, it's hard. You might not be able to do it in a year. You probably have other obligations and work, but you can create a game by yourself. Playcrafting is a really great resource. Um, they have events in New York where they teach people about different components of game design and game production and game development. Um, but they also have these game jam sessions where people can just play each other's games. And there's lots of other places too, like NYU Game School, they have a game night where they invite people to bring their games and have them play tested by students and game designers. Um, the other thing that you can do, if you wanna pitch to a large company, they are at these events occasionally, you could meet them. Um, our company doesn't take submissions for game ideas. There are companies that do. Um, if you do know someone who works in the gaming industry, I'm sure a game designer would love to see your project. They're, we're always usually friendly. <laughs> um, there's, but definitely if you have an idea and you want to test it out and see if it's working and if it's a viable product that you can either pursue yourself or submit to game companies, go to play crafting and other um, playing uh, game play events where game designers play each other's games. There's even one in Hoboken that I keep meaning to go to that. There's one in Morris Plains, I think. It's in Morris Plains? Um, Metatopia. It's oh, okay. Sure. And what was it called again? Metatopia, she was just mentioning, is a really good one. You know what we can do? We can, I'll email you later and we can get a list of these places going and we can put it on our, um, we'll put it on our site or figure out a way to blast it out to people because sure. I think that's a great idea to go to like some of the, the play crafters, would you say? Play crafting, play yeah. Crafting, like some of those places um, to just get an idea of how it, it just mm -hmm. kind of Sure. Ideas people are coming up with. I'm assuming that they have both analog and digital games. 
Yes, most most of these do, but some of them will just have analog games. There's like um, the one in Hoboken that I'm talking about does mostly analog games. Um, but Playcrafting has a big digital component. They teach development classes. We've taught a couple of classes there, and they're a great resource. And if you're just like looking to break into the industry, there's lots of companies there who are constantly looking for developers. They're looking for artists to help them with their projects. So you can meet, meet some great people there. Great, Go to the classes. I highly recommend them. They have one night classes. Any other questions before we wrap up? Thank you, Noel. Thanks for Thank you. Thank you. We're live on uh, our live stream. <laughs> <laughs>